<laughs> we hope all we have learned can take root in your garden. We have a, a presentation for you with some pictures, some things to show you. We're calling these our weekend walkabouts. Welcome to everybody. Um, someplace. Glad you could make it. Yeah. Um, oh, that's right. To the duck privately. Yes. Um, sorry, we're reading the screen at the same time. This is not our usual way to do a presentation. Uh, anyway, we don't could, use uh, what are the politicians use uh, so they can tell. Oh, 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 we don't have, we don't have teleprompter. We do have two black labs. Did you put the labs downstairs? Yes. Good. With cheese bones. Good. So the labs will not be showing up with toys and uh, asking us to throw the ball. So we're calling this weekend walkabout because this uh, is very appropriate for the time. There are lots of people walking all around the neighborhood. I don't know if you've been out in your yard and found, seen people that you've never seen before in your neighborhood walking by and you wonder if they're even from your neighborhood. Um, they are in fact from your neighborhood and they're walking about. So we're gonna talk, call this weekend walkabout and the way that we've set up to do this now is we've got some things to show you and tell you about and then we'll open it up to questions and we'll do the questions by chat, which means that you need to find your chat screen at some point while you're going along here. I see that some people have. Hi, Denise. Hi, Doc. Hi, Susan. Uh, hi, Julie. So there are messages up there. So people do uh, have found the chat screen. So it's possible to find, and we're going to hope you can find it. But we'll proceed with telling you what we uh, have gotten together for you. And we've got several places along the way that we'll just stop for questions. Hopefully, it's about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and then questions, and then 10 minutes and questions. Uh, we have until 9.30. We've actually, we actually have much longer the way we've set up this program, we could stay on if there are more questions. So we'll see what we can do with everybody. Um, and if you are here and you can't figure it out, well, <laughs> I uh, guess you can, I guess join, you can us. join the rest of us. <laughs> if you can't figure out how to chat, we'll get that worked out by we're, next time where we have more. Discussion. We are going to do more webinars. Yeah, Steve's things. had a great time. Yes. Steve said he felt like Ticketmaster yesterday, sitting with and figuring you. out how to fit people in. Um, because right now we have a limited number that we can do. Right, we did. We did limit the number of people. Don't move your chair, Steve. Remember, we I put didn't those move up my chair. I'm moving me. All right, so we'll keep going. Most of you know that we are. Uh, whoops, I have to change our controls. Most of you know that we are um, teachers as well as gardeners, and some of you are in this picture. Uh, Nick, I think you're there somewhere. Although everybody's so bundled up, who can tell who's where? Um, We've called them Garden by Janet and Steve before, and that's kind of what this is, only a virtual one. We'll be going around. And it's, it's been a lot of fun. Those of you who were there while we moved this tree, remember that it was not hard to move this tree. It was not heavy with that many people pulling on it. We didn't need that many people to help, but it was more fun to have more people to help. And we had to stop at about two steps because everybody was laughing so hard that they couldn't keep going. Um, but a great picture. This is our house. Uh, we don't have the snow on the ground anymore, but this is out in uh, at the edge of our driveway and we'll be walking around our yard and one other yard to show you this. Um, I'd like you to try your, your powers of observation here. Here's a garden that we work on in Boston where sadly I cannot be next week as I plan to be. I want you to look and see what you see changed. And people are going to say, well, a lot has changed there. But what changed? that I see as a major thing between here and here. Stephen's looking real hard right now. He's, those of you who can see us, if we're showing on your screen. I'm trying to read what somebody might be saying too. Oh, okay, it's a good yeah. idea. The beach gone. Uh, actually, we've moved farther so we can't see the beach. Uh, what I'm seeing is in the back corner, the ivy on the portion of the building that juts out and has windows facing you. Do you see the ivy? I'm very sad that I can't be there right now because that ivy has climbed all the way up and onto the roof. Uh, the owner has now told me, Jack, if you're there, um, sorry. <laughs> he said, maybe the ivy was a mistake. And one of the things I'm supposed to be doing is cutting Come that down. ivy down yeah. away uh, from everything because it's gotten in the way. And that's one of the first places we're going to start with, with cut downs. Those of you who have been to our performances, <laughs> performances, presentations before, know that we usually have a piece of paper for you that says, here's where we're going. You aren't going to have that today because we only just figured out where we were going the day before yesterday. We'll probably generate one of these in the future. 
But today I'm not going to be showing you a piece of paper to say where we're going. We're just going to be using uh, screens that show like this, prompts that show it's high time to prune. So right now it's time to get out and get those big things. This one is not ivy, this is wisteria. And this is one, count them one, wisteria growing on the side of the building at the uh, Niagara, Niagara Falls. Botanical um, garden. Right, and this is the dormitory for the, the students, students who are in charge of pruning that back. Um, unlike ivy, this one doesn't hold on with little sticky hold fasts that are gonna hold it over the edge but it does, uh, it, it is something you want, don't want to do it. See, one wisteria, that's the same plant. And that plant is now tamed. We're Let's not gonna talk it. about wisteria today. And we're not gonna talk about lilac. Here's a dwarf lilac in the midst of being pruned. Uh, all the stuff laying on the ground came out of the shrub in the center of the picture that was blooming just a minute ago. And when the blooms don't look good anymore is when we're gonna prune that and take all that stuff out of it and bring it down to size. We're not gonna talk about that and we're not gonna talk about the crazies like wisteria right now. Um, we do want things to look better. On the left, looking quite brown because it was April and not leafed out, is that wisteria pruned? Wisteria, lilac. Sorry, lilac, sorry Steve, you shouldn't move your chair. I didn't move my chair. See, I he says me. he didn't move his chair, but I saw him move his chair. Okay, on the left in the brown, is that dwarf lilac sheared repeatedly to keep it small. On the right is that same dwarf lilac pruned in some of the ways we're gonna tell you to keep it small. Um, we don't want the growth to be all up at the outside edge of a plant, which is what happens if you prune all the time. I'm not seeing anything other than Janet and Steve, so we have not, so some, of, some people are not, the screen has not been shared. Oh, we have to keep sharing? New share. Thank you, Gail, for, for chatting that into us here. Um, all right, let's see. Anyone who sees only Janet and Steve, put a chat up. Steve will watch the chat window. I can't. Just to see we if a lot of things seats pop then, up. Because I can't. We got to switch it. seats? I can't read that unless you put it over here. Well, if I put it over there, then I can't navigate. Well, can you? Okay. See, we're working this out. <laughs> Marriage counseling, 44. Anyone who cannot see our pictures of bushes, so there are currently a dwarf lilac bush on. Gail said she had to push more buttons. Oh, oh, Gail says she had to push more buttons to be able to see the screen. Good, thank you, Gail. Oh, I'm so glad for people who know how to do this. I see slide 17 with no problem. Thank you, Barb, Barb V. Um, so at any rate, we would like you not to go out and shear. We would like you to prune things so that they actually work um, the way we want them to work. So cut hard. And I believe that this is not going to work. Yeah. This is me standing and telling you it should be a video, but we didn't realize until the last minute that when we moved our video over to this machine, which is our only one new enough to work on this kind of conferencing with you. It didn't bring the video over with it. Duck, you don't have to start typing. We know what happened. But at any rate, I'm standing there in this video explaining to Stephen and to anyone who might listen to the video that right below me at my feet is a rose. That that rose is cut all the way down to the ground. You can walk on that rose. And, it's, and all of the pieces of the rose are bundled up behind me there in the picture. That's how hard we want you to cut on, on many things. Not necessarily everything, but um, yes. when we say cut hard and we don't explain that, this sometimes happens. You know where this is, Steve. Well, or at least I told you you weren't there with me that day. This is at um, Catherine's house. Yep. <clears throat> and I had told them, cut your hydrangea down hard every spring early in the year so that it will stay small. And this is about five years into their cutting it and Janet not stopping by to see what they were doing. Um, this is such a huge clump of twigs and bristle at the bottom. Crowding new growth out. Right, it's crowding out the new growth. The only new growth that can come is tiny little stuff that comes to form through everything else. And it's dying out in the center. When we cut hard, so I'm cutting that, that one you just saw, we've now moved to next to it. 
um, I'm cutting through with a saw and doing that. When, you, when we say cut hard, we mean cut hard. Cut all of that rubble out of there. And that means that this is that, except up on a stick. It's a dappled willow, one of those things where the new growth comes out kind of white and pink. And the harder you cut it, the more new stuff you're only going to see. Um, we made it purposely Thank you, uh, that Cindy. you're muted. Yeah, we think everybody is muted now, Cindy. So those of you who have to cough, and I hope there's not many of you that have to cough because we want to know that we yeah. all stayed well by getting out of the out of the mainstream quickly. Um, so you shouldn't worry about being heard. So this is a smoke bush, a smoke bush pruned not to go to the ground. Julie, who's listening to us now, you have one that I prune all the way down to the ground every year. So this one is pruned to just several hard, several main trunks that are cut hard and all the little stuff cut out every year. So you go in and cut out all the little stuff and leave only the big stubs and it does that three weeks later and that about four weeks after that. And that's precisely how Longwood Gardens does it in an alley, a long alley with smoke bush all along it. They do the same thing. They right. leave those big knots in it and they don't want the flowers. They only want the foliage to go with the annuals. It's a great right. contrast. Yeah, on the, on the smoke bush, to cut hard like this and make it look like this, you're going to end up losing the flower but not on the things we're talking to you about. When we say cut hard, we're going to talk about cutting hard not on the hydrangeas. things that you can cut I, hard. Did I say hydrangea? It's a smoke bush. Okay. Yeah, it's not a hydrangea. It's a smoke bush. We will talk about hydrangeas. I've got lots of pictures of hydrangeas coming up. First, I'm talking about the things that we cut hard, um, all of the things we cut hard. This is a mulberry, weeping mulberry. This is what Catherine saw from her doorway coming out. And she called last year and said, I, I, I love my weeping mulberry, but I don't know how to prune it. And it's gotten so big, I don't know what to do with it. There it is next to her, her door. I called her. She'd never met me before. Someone just said we could help her. I called her and said, look, I can help you out. Um, and, and I've only got X amount of time. It didn't quite work out that we could get together for the whole time. So she let me prune. And I started out with what you see here on the left before I started to prune, on the right after I started to prune. I told her, here's what you could do. Not quite done yet, because all the little rabble is not cut out. I said, we could cut it down like this, but that was still too big if it's, if it's that high. She'd have to get on a ladder to cut it. Um, so we did this. You see on the right, it's not a cut off picture. That's all there is left of the mulberry is it's cut hard back to several main trunks all within reach of the porch and the lawn from that seen from her neighbor's view to that that's cut hard some things you cut all the way down to the ground not this weeping mulberry we want it to look like a tree and it is grafted you'll see that in a minute right there that thickened part with a, a line that goes all the way around the trunk and makes it bolt right there that portion below the line is a straight trunked mulberry that isn't growing as fast as the top because the top is bigger yeah a lot of times these grafts are not totally compatible and the graft will bulge like that but if a if something grows from the trunk it will grow straight if it grows from above that line it will weep over so we don't want to cut it all the way to the ground because she doesn't want a straight mulberry she wants a weeping mulberry this is what it looked like about five weeks after we cut it it was a slow spring last year so it took a long time but she trusted us which is amazing that she did and this is then looking from the uh from the porch out uh, at this point on something like this weeping mulberry when you cut it hard you would rub out some of those buds you would say no i don't need that many branches and you'd simply reach out with your finger and rub out the bud when it's very soft like that um, and then about a month later here's what it looked like all beautiful fresh foliage just like that and then here's what it looked like through the summer okay so we've now now what it looks like last year at this time it looked like the picture on the left this year, right now, it looks like the one on the right. Except that right now, I went by 
to show Catherine how to prune it now that we're down to the size where she can keep it herself. So now you're gonna look at all of these sticks and say, I got a lot of little sticks, I got a few big sticks, and you're gonna prune it like this. You're going to say, I'll keep those two big sticks and I'll cut them back to just barely above where they come from and I'll take out all the little stuff. But we're into our usual pro problem here if nobody else can control the, the, uh, the controls there. <laughs> so I hope that makes sense. When we say cut hard, that's what we mean is cut all the way to the ground on something that grows from the ground or cut all the way back to where it's coming from on the graft if it's something like a weeping mulberry or that dappled willow, um, a cotoneaster um, on a standard like this. Wouldn't do it to a weeping cherry. Well, not until after it blooms. And uh, we have written articles yep. and put them up to show people after your weeping cherry blooms, then you do this to it. You cut the living daylights out of it because it grows like nobody's business. But we know that we usually dodge hydrangea questions because they're usually the biggest pruning questions we get in the springtime. People are so confused about hydrangeas. Yeah, I, sometimes <laughs> me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're going to go through hydrangeas starting with the hydrangeas that you can cut all the way down. This is a panicle hydrangea. Probably the most popular hydrangeas right now are panicle hydrangeas like Limelight, Unique, Pink Diamond, Pinky Winky. This one is Tardiva. Um, they're big, big plants. This is at the entrance to a subdivision. This plant is about 10 feet tall. This plant, singular, right. that's one plant. Um, if you don't want it to be that big, then um, I think I... Um, you do it. Then you can prune it. These are hands. panicle hydrangeas on a standard. And let's see if we're, if we're sharing our screen. Let's see if we can make this chat a little bit off the edge. So somebody's breathing a sigh of relief. They kept trying to push it out of the way, and it's on our screen <laughs> that it was in the way. These panicle hydrangeas are on a standard. They're not grafted, but repeatedly over years, people cut them back only to one point in order to make them look more like a tree. So if you've got a panicle hydrangea that you want to make look like a tree, you do what we showed you to the mulberry. There you, went. you cut the living daylights out of it so it looks like a, a mop handle sticking out of the ground with a club of little twigs, of, of big, hopefully big twigs sticking out of it. Uh oh, I moved the chat window, so that means I now have to go back here. Okay, um, some hydrangeas, the panicle hydrangeas, you can cut all the way down, and the the snowball hydrangeas, your grandma's old-fashioned white round-topped bloom, you can cut those guys all the way down to the ground. There's a bunch of hydrangeas you can't cut all the way to the ground unless you're willing to give up the bloom for the year. At Julie's house here. Her oak leaf hydrangea had gotten too big. Anybody who thinks oak leaf hydrangea is a, a little bit little guy, yeah, <laughs> you are wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. This is her it's oak leaf beautiful hydrangea. big guy. Yeah, getting out of hand and up over the windows. And we've cut those branches that were too big. We took them out all the way to the ground. So that one that you see on the left picture sticking up highest, up. It's actually the last one left of five or six that were that high the year before. And I went in, crawled underneath the bush in the springtime, found the biggest, thickest stem at the bottom and sawed it off and took it out and that brought the height down. You're looking at them in the year when we brought the last piece all the way down. If you have a hydrangea that blooms on new, on old wood, which is oak leaf hydrangea, climbing hydrangea, the blue and the pink hydrangeas, then you're going to prune them this way. You're going to prune some things out every year in order to, to keep the bloom, or you're going to bite the bullet, cut the whole thing down and start over and not have any or very much bloom this year. I hope that makes sense. It's why we dodge hydrangea questions. This is an uh, oak leaf hydrangea, the size people want it to be. This oak leaf hydrangea, every single year, I take half the canes out of it down in the plant. And you can do it any time of the year, knowing that what grows new is not gonna bloom that year, but yep. you've left a bunch of old stuff to bloom. So you go down into the base and you cut old shrubs, old canes out. So these are the ones at Julie's house. 
Can you tell which are the old canes? See how big and thick and peeling bark they are? And the peeling bark's part of what it's supposed to do. That's not a problem yeah, in not, this case. Yeah, not a problem on oak leaf hydrangea, but it indicates it's an older cane. You can probably also see a bunch of straight sticks. Those are the new growth that came up after I started cutting old stuff out. The plant went, oh, and started making new stuff. And that new stuff is going to be within your range of, of uh, allowability for four or five years. So if you cut out about a quarter of the stems every year, the stem you cut out, of course, is not going to bloom because you cut it out in the spring, but all the rest but. are left to bloom. Um, other things you can cut back hard are Rose of Sharon. This is a Rose of Sharon. If you look, you can see where we cut it to every year. Given its, its own head, this one grows about three or four feet a year. I said, okay, three or four feet a year, but we want you to be five feet tall. That means I cut it down to two feet. You can see where the stems two, are thicker. Two and, a half, yep. and every once in a while, I cut one of those stems all the way down, but just keep new stuff coming so it doesn't get so big and ugly and knuckly as that smoke bush I showed you earlier. Cut it down like that. Mm -hmm. um, so the panicle hydrangeas can be cut. I showed you all the way to the ground, just saw them off. Or in this case at Jack's, hi Jack, if you're there, um, at Jack's, we can let them be bigger than that. We can let them be about six feet. So every year in the spring, this is last year in the springtime, um, every year in the spring, they look like this. They've bloomed. You can see the flowers on them because panicle the, the old flowers on these. Panicle hydrangea blooms on new wood. It means everything that grows from this spring is going to bloom. We'll, we'll create a flower bud and bloom. Right. I prune them down like this every year. So last year, they looked like this, and then I made them look like this. See how short they are? And then they looked like this when they bloomed. And that's allowable in the size that we want, so that's what we do. So we take the one on the left, watch it now. Can you see the saw dust in the middle bottom? It's whitish. That's where I took out whole trunks. I took the oldest trunks out, there's two spaces where I sawed them off and some stubble. Did that every year and then shortened everything that was left. You see, they were like this and now they're like this. So options on panicle hydrangea, saw the thing all the way off to the ground, don't even care, or bring it down part way. Then it adjust it to the height you want. Yep. If it's on a standard, you're going to um, cut it so that it's got a knob with pieces coming out of it. The stuff you cut out is not always just the old stuff, but you can see the stuff that bent around here. It's not pretty wood. I've cut that out. And it could cause problems with crossing and rubbing. Rubbing, yeah. If you left them. So you don't worry about it. I said, <clears throat> I'm going to leave three or four or five strong canes on it, and I'm getting rid of all of that ugly stuff. I tell people, and I, I wish I could be out with everybody in the garden because I'd love to see more people do this. Just don't agonize over it. Cut it and let it grow. Watch what it does. Learn. Yep. You don't, you don't know a plant till you've killed it anyway. Right. We don't anyway. <laughs> so that's always your option. Oh, well, that didn't work. Just saw it off. Now, the blues and the pinks, and we know every stop it. <laughs> we know everybody loves these. We love them too, uh, but this one's on <clears throat> Cape Cod. That's where they grow and bloom really well. They bloom on old wood, on wood that grew till last year. It had to stop, and then grows for a little longer this year before it makes makes flower. So the blue and the pink ones have to keep their tip growth, the ends of the branches have to stay alive through the winter, or they aren't going to be old enough to bloom next year, or they'll bloom real late, way after everything else is covered up and probably small. So there's the tip bud in July after it blooms. It's over between my thumbs on the left side of the picture. That bud is the important one. It, that bud is not just a leaf. It's the new growth. It's, it's the, all the growth. Yeah, it's the entire year. shoot for next year 
is forming in there and just not filling up with water. And then it's going to sit there all winter and then push out and it'll have enough uh, age behind it already that it, that it blooms come July, August. But for us in Michigan, and some of you I know are not in Michigan, but in the Midwest and, and in places that are colder than zone six and not as moist in the air as a coastal city, city. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, well, city, peninsula. So for us, our buds in the spring look like what you see on the left. They got killed over the winter. They might still be there, but can you see how brown and decrepit they are? Some cells froze and exploded and killed it. Meanwhile, the shoot on the right, a Cape Cod shoot, is, is alive. Can you see there that it's all the leaves, the shoot, everything's there. Even the, the, the new tip bud and the flower are Even there. Even the flower. Yeah, well, they're all there. Yeah, they can't see it pointing. It doesn't make any We're sense. We're so used to, to using point. a pointer. We'll, be, we'll figure out how to use a We're pointer. We're working on stuff. We have this cool screen that says uh, that we can, um, we can highlight and annotate. Actually, it's up here, Steve. Oh. It's here, ah. and I can tell it that I would like to spotlight. And then I can say spotlight. Um, oh, I've got it too little. Never oh, wow. mind. Never mind. We're it not, works. We're not going to look Eventually. at that. Eventually. Yeah, we're not going to look at that. Onward. Steve was pointing at the bud. It's closed. Okay. We don't want you to be there. There you go. Okay, it's time for questions here. So if, you're, if you want to know if it's possible for your blue or pink hydrangea to, to bloom, then sacrifice one of the tip buds and slice through it. If it looks like A, you got it made. Unless the spring frost kills it as it comes out, <laughs> yeah, that bud's going to bloom. B is not, and C, of course, where the deer ate it off, is not going to bloom. Um, if they are going to bloom for you, then here's what you do to them. What I showed you with the oak leaf hydrangea, and you can do this at any time of year, but it's easiest to do now. Here they are. Here they are. I took out yeah. that old stuff, crooked stuff, extra stuff. I took those and took that out. So I left all the stuff that, all the stuff that I left has tip buds and it's gonna bloom. All the stuff I took out, uh, well, too late, you guys aren't gonna bloom. <laughs> and it's not a big loss once you, overall for the plant. You know? Not a big loss for the plant and we don't want them to be huge. We want them to be small. Do you do that every year? We do that every single year because we don't want these to be bigger than this. We don't want them to be taller. They could be five feet tall. <laughs> Thank you, Doc. She, the doc, she does. Doc She's has ruthless. Type. I think other people might be able to see that chat Where, too. No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. There they are um, on the top. You'll see them blooming when that wasn't done to them in a year when they were killed back. Uh, ignore all the writing. It's something that I sent to the, the owner of the property about what we, why we were doing what we're doing. They're huge and they have just a few blooms on them from a couple of branches that survived or from low growth that grew up. What we want is for them to look like as they do on the left below, we're looking at them from the other angle. We want them to be that size and blooming. And so that's why we cut them every year. If we, um, if we didn't want them, if we wanted to just let them keep on growing. They would get rather large. Yeah. So there they are blooming. And that's the same year that I showed them cut there on the upper right with all the branches out um, in the springtime. And there they are on the upper left blooming when it's blooming time. But that's on Cape Cod, you guys. I don't <laughs> know how many of you in the Midwest are going to do that. And we can do it any time of year. On the upper right, you're seeing me doing that after they've leafed out or after they bloom or in the fall. Doesn't matter. What about my burning bush? Your burning bush could be the cut ground, all man. the way to the ground. And that's where we're going back now to other bushes. Lots of things can be cut all the way to the ground. You're looking here at a bad picture. I'm sorry. Stephen was not with me. Stop that. Well, okay, plus We're not supposed to say we sorry. can't come back in 20 minutes or an hour. We're gardeners. We're working by the hour. So that's where the shadows were before I got going. There are four dwarf spireas here, uh, gold flame, actually probably gold mound, and a butterfly bush. And an hour later, that's the area. It's a bundled up, and that's okay. a good way to do twigs. 
don't try to stuff them into the bags. Yeah, just bundle yeah. them up four foot long in bundles that you could handle and tie with twine. Yep. 75 minutes, I cut those four spirea, one butterfly bush, and four calicarpas, that's beautyberry, all the way down to the ground. And that's what you see bundled up there, as well as a couple of branches from a dappled willow that I took out because we can let it grow big, but we can't, don't want it to get old and hoary looking. So well, the reason we cut all the way to the ground is to keep something real small um, and because it's easier and quicker to do it that way. Just do one cut. Don't go out there and shear. And, and you think less about it. You could get, get more into your garden meditation instead of <laughs> agonizing over whether I should cut this branch or not. Yeah, and don't we need garden meditation right now? <clears throat> Here's spirea growing back after being cut all the way to the ground. This is about four weeks later. Wygelia, my Monet. Can I cut back? Um, you can cut Wygelia all the way back. Um, uh, just one note aside here in the picture that's up. Um, these are, I'm looking right down into the beauty bush that I'm cutting all the way to the ground. And as I cut, I saw color. I saw this. That's one of our native pink ladybugs. She's also a good eater of insects. And she was spending the winter in those twigs. So I waited till she crawled the rest of the way down before I cut. Um, so other things you can cut all the way down. Blue mist spirea, that's caryopteris. Butterfly bush, dwarf spireas, um, uh, um, beauty berry that gets their bloom later in the year. Anything you're growing just for foliage, like smoke bush, gold, vicary, privet, um, some of the... Uh, um, elderberries. On Wygelia, which blooms on old wood and new wood, you can treat them like a blue or pink hydrangea and just take some branches out every year. That's what I do because they get old and gnarly real quickly. Or you can cut them all the way to the ground and you'll get, your, you'll get all your bloom later than you would have on all new branches. It's a question, do we prefer to cut in spring or fall, we prefer to cut when, <coughs> when we're out in the garden sometimes. That's... <clears throat> yes, yeah, we cut when we cut. Excuse me there for the cough. I do not, I am not she sick. Is, we appear no. to both be well. I have a, 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 a lifelong sinus infection <clears throat> and, um, and it, it makes me cough at this time of year when the spores are coming up. Okay. Uh-oh, the labs are talking. Stephen's I, I, gonna I go, need to take a break. Stephen's going to go and give the labs, the black labs, a new, new something two. to occupy themselves with. You can do this cutting I'm showing you in the fall. There, if it is a brand new young plant, you probably don't want to do it in its first fall because it's still, when we think of fall, the plant is still in the process of transferring carbohydrates down to its roots and storing energy. Older, once it's been there for a year, go ahead and cut it. It doesn't need to store any more energy than it's, than, than it's already stored. They get too big. Okay, evergreens, and we gotta get going, I'm behind. Evergreens, here's juniper. On the right, pruned back off of the pavement. On the left, not yet pruned. Now, if you're looking at the right, you'll see that there's only about four inches there. Can beauty bush go all the way down after a uh, beauty bush can go all the way down to the ground anytime beauty bush is a very lusty grower um, uh, beauty bush blooms on new wood so if you cut it all the way to the ground now you're not going to get the bloom this year but you can cut it all the way down to the ground now you could cut it all the way down to the ground right after it bloomed it would still grow back up uh, back to the juniper it's rug juniper on the right if you if you're looking between the juniper and the driveway there's only about a four inch gap because I'm cutting it four inches back off of the driveway. I don't really want a lot of weeds growing next to it, but I want to back further. But if you look at what's been cut out, many of those branches are two, three feet long because I don't, you don't just shear the edge. You cut back in, just like I've been showing you with these hydrangeas, you cut back in to take the, some old thick wood out too. So they're cut on the right, cutting out branches that I went, I just grabbed the branch and followed it back to a place where it joined another branch and clipped it off. And now I've done the left. So don't just shear evergreens. Here's a bigger juniper, same thing. This one though is coming two feet out over the, over the parking lot at Tollgate, um, an MSU demonstration farm. And there it is cut back. 
If you shear, you get a straight wall and a buildup of dead old wood. If you cut back in and thin as you cut, you keep the feathered look and the new growth coming on the plant. So I was taking branches off that were that big on that juniper. That fork is stuck in at the edge. You saw it a couple of minutes ago in a picture, stuck in, and it's stuck in the same place. Um, keep your, your questions that are up there, we're gonna get to in, in, uh, in just a minute, or we'll get to them after the presentation and send them to you. Um, that fork is in at the edge of the bed. We didn't move the fork. We just moved the plant back by cutting. And I say we, because in this case, it was a garden by Janet and Steve, and we had other people helping us cut. Forks not moved, the bush is just moved. So there's lots of possibilities here. Here's Deb, hi Deb, and me cutting on a U hedge. And we're going to cut to cut it down and let it grow for the year, but we're also gonna thin it. My left hand two fingers, the V for victory over there, they're indicating the thicker branch. We're also cutting out the thicker branches. So what we do is we cut it down and down by down, I mean cut it so that there's enough room for it still to grow and not be too big for you. So we're cutting it down and we do this every year on this, this U hedge. Deb's cutting with the power shears, I'm cutting with head shears. And then we're gonna reach in and pat and feel the thicker pieces, cut them with hand pruners and throw them out. You could actually feel the bigger pieces with the palms of your hand as you're patting the, the stiffer, the harder pieces. Yeah, watch for when we put um, in the newsletter, now that we've started back up, when we put our garden by Janet and Steve opportunities, those are the times when we take you out there and let you do this. My right hand on the left, as you look at it here, where I'm leaning on the bush, I'm patting it. And you pat, you find the places that are thicker and resist your pat, and you clip them out and throw them out. This is that U hedge in late June of that year. Grown up, allowed to be able to grow, to have all that nice new growth, but does not need to be cut again that year. And that's what I'd like more of you guys to do. And leave it so it stays fluffy. fluffy. Yeah. Here's a uh, boxwood sheared repeatedly. There's me cutting it back once for the year. I've cut it and reshaped it. It used to be the blue dots showing you on the left where the bottom went angled in, uh, narrowed in. That's not good. It's shady down there. The plant's going to lose all the foliage down there. It needs to go down to the ground straight like the blue line on the right. So I've reshaped it and thinned it. Hedge of boxwood that I've reshaped on the top is cut down. See, see how much shorter it is? I know it's just a little bitty picture, but it is now down far enough that it can grow for the whole year and not have to be cut again. And on the bottom pictures, it's reshaped because someone had been shaping it straight up and down and bent in at the bottom. I leaned it back. When you do that, bend it in at the bottom, it shades out and it starts to die back. Yep. Um, okay, so this boxwood, some people ask, do you do this every year? And Mark, I think you're listening right now. I'm thinking as I left you the other day that, oh my gosh, your boxwoods, they're getting big. And uh, it's a big job to cut a lot of boxwoods. These boxwoods at a client's, I cut every two years. And you're looking at one right now, that I and I do it in August. You can pick your time and do it. Spring is easiest. You're not walking on tulip bulbs and stuff. But on, on the left side of the plant, it, I've already cut it back. On the right side, it hasn't been cut back. On the right side, you're looking at two years growth. I cut it back hard enough that this can grow for two years before I have to spend the time to do it again. So I cut it like that, and then I thin it. The middle picture is now it's been thin. And now that's what they look like on the far right after I cut them. And they look like that for almost two years until they start looking a little shaggy. So look at your shrubs now and look for this problem with this shape. 
This is a, it's not boxwood, it's Japanese holly, but it's very much like boxwood and we deal it. Very similar. It's an evergreen we grow for foliage. Can you see that it's thick up at the top and the sides are straight and the bottom is beginning to start, I'm seeing legs. I've now cut it where it's angled in and thinned it so it can keep growing even in the middle, not just at the top and I mean interior middle. And if you look at the bottom to talk about the shading out, look at the very bottom of both plants and look how much more green is on the right hand side that right. sprout on the bottom is coming out. So oops. So your use can look like that with just one pruning once a year. These are that one is a hedge. We keep it uniform. This one, there's two of them, two U's that we let be more like the natural shape of a U. We cut them not sheared right across the top, but we take whole branches out like that. And then when they get cut every two years in August, we're reaching in and grabbing that long one and reaching all the way down in and cutting a long piece out. Not just taking it from the top. I know you're going to want to come out to a garden by Janet and Steve with us. Other evergreens, lavender all the way to the ground. If it's old, you might have to do it a little at a time, like some this year and some next year. But if it's been cut to the ground all the time, it always has leaves. It always there. has buds down, down low. I'm halfway through cutting it there. And can you see the new green coming? Three weeks later, and then they're up, they bloom, and then you cut them again the next year. Winter after they were cut like that, and then we cut them again. And they bloom. Thyme, Thyme is a shrub. And it's a woody plant. Right, it finally made it out to hide the curb. And this year had a bad year, bad winter. Sometimes it does. This is a thyme edge in California. Even in California, it has a bad year sometimes, bad winter. I've cut out what died back. It leaves those gaps in it. This person said, oh, please don't cut it back. It just covered my stupid, ugly wall. I said, no, but it's, it's too, too dead and old. If I look close, I see that the green is way down under. So I cut it back, just like the one in California. And there it is in June. It's creeping. Same year. Well, I'm sorry, this is the end of the year. Um, but by June, it was crept, crept back out. OK, we're going to take a look through your questions. There was a quick question about what to do with very old lilacs. Very old lilacs. Right now, you're going to do like the oak leaf hydrangea. You're going to go into the bottom of the plant with a saw. You're going to pick without looking up. Don't look up and say, what am I cutting out of the top? Don't do that. Just go down to the bottom, look only at the canes, take the thickest ones, and some of them might be as big around as your leg. Or, yes. Yeah. And you need to cut those out all the way to the ground. So you're probably going to say, I got to cut this one out. Then reach up and cut some of the, cut it up higher first so the weight is gone, and then cut those out. You need new suckers coming up. Can we cut the lavender? Yes, now? I've already cut lavender all over the place. You can cut it now. I the don't know how to go back. Ground is, is uh, you need to move the chat window over into our thing, and then you can use the scroll bar. OK, um, so anyway, that's what you're going to yeah, do with lilac. And you're just, you just take out old canes way down in the, in the center of the plant and let it grow back new. And then if you also need to keep that old lilac smaller than lilac wants to be, which is 12, 15 feet, then you might also cut it after it blooms. You might shorten the branches that bloom right after they finish blooming. Very good info, somebody says. How can we tell when the ground is too soft to walk on for pruning? Um, we need well, we're stools gonna, with cushions. Yes. <laughs> OK, put that on the list, stools with cushions. Um, how do we know it's too, uh, like a bounce test or something? <laughs> um, it's, it's ironic that the duck is asking that question. So people say it's too early to garden. But if it was too early to garden, you would put something out to spread your weight out. Um, hi, duck. <laughs> um, we have little snowshoes. And snowshoes work great, but it's not too early. This would be a very wet, cold spring. This would be February. This would be the 1st of March. Right now, the ground is warm enough. The plants have taken up the water. The best test that you can get is if the plants are coming up 
If the plants are coming up out of the ground and they're a couple, three inches out of the ground, there's enough warmth in that ground that the water's gone and you can walk on it. Um, you can also do the test of taking some of the soil in your hand and closing it in your fist and then opening your fist. If the soil crumbles back open, it's ready. If it stays in a tight ball and you can't knock it loose, it's still too wet. To oh, it's your snow uh, Can you cut your bush clematis? Cut your push bush clematis all the way down to the ground? Yes, you can. We do all the time, unless you can let it get bigger. How to cut nine bark? Nine bark is a two-stage cut. It's a little, and Wygelia is like this too, and so is the oak leaf hydrangea. It's blooming on the wood that's that it made last year, but we want them smaller. So go into the bottom of the plant, cut some branches all the way out right now, older ones if you've got older ones, but, but half of them at any rate. And then after it blooms, cut the ones that bloomed halfway back. Uh, cut red twig to the ground or just large canes? Um, that, you, you, yep. that depends on What's if your? you want the color. Um, well, the color, I think. the color is always going to be there. Um, in some, the new growth is always going to be bright red on a red twig. Do you want it to be big or little? If you cut a red twig dogwood all the way down to the ground, it's going to grow, if it's in a good place, it's going to grow to five feet tall that year. Straight twigs, all red. If you can let it be bigger than that, then you can cut some canes out and leave some canes. If you're into pollinator gardening, red twig dogwood does bloom on new wood. And so by leaving some canes, you're leaving some early blooms for things. So you Pyrrha. can, oh, sorry. Pyrrhus, Pyrrhus yeah. japonica is an evergreen like rhododendron, azalea, boxwood, and yew. You can cut it back as far as you want to cut it. Um, if it. If you want to enjoy all of the bloom, then treat it like oak leaf hydrangea. Cut some old wood out every year, and then after it blooms, cut it as hard as you want to cut it and let it grow for the rest of the year. Thank you for the compliment. And we'll be doing more of these presentations, burning bush, old plant. Okay, I'm going to keep okay. on going. Our feet put a lot of pressure on the ground. So you can cut down the perennials now. Can you see the green in that garden? See the green coming up? That's your indication it's okay to walk in that garden. That's the first of April in, in this particular year. Much uh, colder than it was this year. Um, if you cut down, I cut down by hand because I like to see the plants well. Um, burning bushes can be cut all the way to the ground, Mary. Every bit down to the ground. Uh, after it's cut back, it looks nicer. It's not necessary to cut back, and there are a lot of insects and things that might be on that stuff, but it changes the ratio of green to brown very quickly, makes it look better for us. Go ahead and go for it. Um, if you cut down big stuff, so grasses that you left up because you wanted to look at them for the winter, we're bungee cording it first. Dom and I are walking around it and wrapping it tight. Then we're cutting it with loppers at the ground all the way down because it's easier to handle them. Okay, weeds. So pruning is our, our first topic. If you've got pruning questions and we haven't gotten to them, We'll keep the chat up, Steve and I, and we'll get to them, and uh, we'll stay on as long as we need to stay on to do that, but other people, we want to keep moving so we don't keep you. We, our idea was, let's do this early on a Saturday morning so that people can then go out and do something before somebody else in the households finds something for them to do. And time is flying. Gee. Yeah. Well, it always does when we have gardeners that tell and about stuff. And have fun. Okay. All right, weeds, you need to jump on them now and start at the edge. Always the edge, weeds come from the edge. Lawn creeps in from the edge. Plain, All through the winter. Yeah, plain old blue grass can grow 18 inches over the winter with a, with a creeper. Quack grass can grow further than that. So we, we cut an edge on this bed. Most of our gardens, we cut the edge. It's just as effective as a black plastic or a, um, a metal edge or a, um, yeah, a plastic or metal edge, um, but we have to recut it. We just like the look of it better. You cut it. Steve, you watch me do this. I'm going to get a drink of water. Yeah, she cuts it so that it push, push the, the blade down and then pull back on it so it pops up into the bed. See how it's popping the soil up into the bed that loosens at least eight to 12 inches into the bed so that you can then get to those and then 
she uses her fork to go in there. She cuts the uh, edge, say, oh, 10 to 12, 15 feet long, goes back, and then after she pops, it goes back with the fork and loosens it and can feel. She's feeling for the roots and the weeds um, as she's pulling them out. And I do the 10 feet and then 10 feet because this time of year, don't go out there and do the same thing for an hour straight. Your body can't take it. Use the shovel for 10 feet, <clears throat> then crouch down and use your hands for 10 feet. Some of us, the body can't take it. Yeah. But you reach in, look how far in yeah. she's going. That's so. how far that the roots went. When you grab that edge that you cut and you lift up, you can feel where the roots are attached. And that's how far in the grass was growing. It was just normal bluegrass. This is a uh, quack grass growing further into the bed so that when I picked up the edge to edge it, I couldn't get the whole root. So I took the fork and loosened even further into the bed and chased it that far into the yeah, bed. And you're kind of jiggling the fork as you're trying to get this out. Cause if you break a piece off, if there's a node, it's going to sprout. Um, this edge took me about 40 minutes to do. It's about a 60 foot edge, 40 minutes. Um, I can do about 100 feet. This is a 100-foot edge going all the way around the bed. It's 100 feet. It takes about an hour. And when you're done, if you look at that bed, you can see that it's roughed up 12, 18 inches into the bed. You've actually weeded most of the bed by the time you're done edging, and you've gotten the worst weeds. And it's so hard to stick with. Just stay in the edge. Don't, don't see something and jump into because you'll forget where you were on the edge, I promise you. So we do the edge first. This is a, now when we're cutting an edge, people say, how deep do you cut it? This is a very sandy soil and we're gonna end up cutting a deeper edge because the edge, we wanna keep it from collapsing back in. The reason an edge, a cut edge keeps grass out is that it's air and you gotta keep that edge open. This edge also was much weedier with a different kind of weed. The stuff growing up in there is um, sour sorrel, which, also, like quackgrass goes a long way in. I do it the same way, put the shovel in, lean back on the handle to loosen. And then this sour sorrel has little skinny cobwebby like roots going in all directions, each of which can grow. Um, so I know I've got sour sorrel, so I loosen with a fork uh, earlier in the year. And you can edge when it, see there's frost on it here. I was edging earlier, you can stay on the grass. But the purple in there is the sour sorrel foliage. Purple is, a, is an antifreeze in that plant. It's really good at growing in the cold. Keep going. There's where the edge is, where the orange dots are. So I'm after that plant. I know it's that far into the bed. And, um, and you can see the roots on it. See the, the white coming up everywhere? I had to chase those all the way in with a fork. But they came from the edge. So always, always weed your edge first. Just take the fork and loosen and follow further up. And you get all of that out. The reason that we jump on the weeds now, this is not a weed, it's a crocosmia. A lot of people like growing crocosmia in their perennial gardens. I pulled that out of the ground now, this time, April 1st, March 30th, March 20th, on a warm year like this. That All that white stuff is brand new mm. root. That's the new part of the plant growing its roots for this year. You need to get out there and get these weeds out before they get those roots out and really shoot the tops up. And that means if you do weed now, get some mulch down. It might be hard to get mulch this year. I'm going to call a few places. Yeah. We'll report next week. Uh, are, the plants, of that. are the plants coming in as they're supposed to? Because they'd be coming in, they'll start coming into nurseries right now. And are that's they, the mulch coming in. Yeah, but are they prior, you know, shipping? Is it? If they're coming from Oregon, is are yeah. you shipping from Oregon now? Yeah, so you might not be able to get uh, a lot of our of, of the mulch you usually use, but you can use leaves, and you do not take the leaves off the beds. Leave the leaves on the beds unless you need to take them off to weed or to dig. Leave them there; they will break down, and the plants will cover them up. So I'm using leaves that we've saved as a mulch there. Um, There's. Lots of different types of mulches. You could see that we've used a couple of different types. And, and in this in bed, this you're looking bed. at there's some leaves in here and also some bark. What you don't mulch on top of is growing green growth. 
And in those two circles that look empty there, there's actually, if you're there in person, you'll see lots of wisps Real of fine. threadleaf coreopsis coming up and artemisia coming up. And you don't want to mulch over once they've started to grow, but you can grow right and up. You're kind of limiting their space to finding where their space is going to be that yeah. way. If you don't have leaves, there's cocoa hulls on the left there. I wonder if they're going to stop producing chocolate. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. Anyway, oh. we just this week, and we'll report on it next week, I used evergreen branches as a mulch mm -hmm. and put them down on the ground. You can use the pine needles that you raked up off your lawn as a mulch. You can use shredded newspaper as a mulch. And don't think pine needles and oak leaves are going to change the pH or the acidity of your soil. Good it point. takes years and years and years to change acidity via organics. Yeah. Um, we like to use the mulch on the lower right, a finer textured, darker mulch, because it breaks down more readily. And it keeps the soil uh, moist. Yeah, well, it all, really does. Yeah, they all do. Yeah, all but. mulch keeps the soil moist. But the stuff that breaks down more quickly lets us work in the beds more because we don't want to be always raking big wood chips out of the way. Plus, big wood chips do take some nitrogen. Well, everything takes nitrogen to break down. The bacteria and fungus in the soil need nitrogen in order to do their work, which is eating organic matter. So if you put a lot of wood on the ground, you get a lot of, organ of uh, microbes breaking it down, and they're using up the nitrogen that your plants might want to use. So if you use big chips, do it around bigger plants that have much wider root systems like shrubs and trees. This is wood chips on the left, fresh wood chips, fresh. and cocoa hulls on the right. Perennials, four inch pots, planted in April, and this is planted and mulched, and this is August. Can you see how much bigger they get when they're little and that's the only place they've got roots and they had to compete with the mulch breaking down? It's not going to make a difference in the long run. In the long run that you couldn't tell the difference which were which, but... But finer mulches are better for things with smaller root systems. Now the cocoa so, hulls probably per cubic foot are more expensive. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't do a whole bed like that. Plus you probably buy out all the M&Ms in the store if, if you did that. Yeah, he means that after I come home, when I come home after I've been mulching with cocoa hulls, all I want to do is eat chocolate all night. Um, we had a question about Father, Father Gilla, Gilla pruning. Father Gilla blooms on new wood, and it blooms in a minute here. It'll be blooming. You can prune it as hard as you want to prune it, and it'll come back, but you'll lose the bloom if you prune it before bloom. Uh, you can thin it just like you do oak leaf hydrangea, or you can wait until after it blooms and prune it as hard as you want. Go ahead, Steve. I was gonna... Um... Delivery should be fine on mulches and stuff. We don't know, That's it just occurs to me that delivery depends on people being there, and some people may say, I'm not going to work and meeting people. Other people may be doing it. I think we should be able to get delivery as yeah. well. Um... Uh, bridal veil shrubs, uh, assuming bridal, bridal veil, veil spirea. spirea. The big spireas called big. bridal veil and bridal wreath and van hoodii are spring bloomers. Not They're not the dwarf spireas that bloom in June and July. They're the spring bloomers in With May. white. Those you do like oak leaf hydrangea, where you take some old stuff out all the time to keep them new. And after they bloom, you can cut them as hard as you want to cut them. Same with forsythia. Things that bloom in the spring, I've got one client. This is picture pop. The uh, question popped up about forsythia. Forsythia, just as you said. Um, I have one client that has a first, has forsythia in a space that it's way too small for forsythia. It's only about three feet, four feet across, but she wants to have forsythia there. So every year, right after it blooms, I cut it all the way down to the ground, and I've shown you pictures of what all the way to the ground means. I cut it all the way to the ground and then let it grow. And every year it gets to be about waist high to me, sometimes even bigger than that. And it blooms and then I go, sorry guy, and I cut it down again. Or you can thin them out and shorten them after they bloom. There are dwarf uh, forsythia that I've seen, but I've never liked the blooms nearly as much as the regular forsythia. It seems like the bigger ones, it seems like even cutting them short, they still bloom better, better. than the than the mini ones. Yeah, the dwarf forsythia is like uh, Arnold is a, a <clears throat> Arnold has a, a dwarf forsythia. 
they are uh, the forsythia species the buds flower buds are not hardy into zone five and into zone four like up around green bay and and north in, in michigan the flower buds get killed like those hydrangea buds that i showed you earlier so they don't bloom the leaf buds do fine and um uh, the the dwarf forsythia i think were selected from forsythias that aren't so hardy minnesota landscape arboretum and ontario's um uh oh forgot the name of the arboretum it's up in zone three they worked together along with vermont and new hampshire on hardier forsythias and they gave us minnesota sun yeah uh yeah that, those same nurseries are working on the um same areas are working on the hardiness japanese hardier japanese hardier maples japanese maples too, maples too. So. Okay. okay, so I don't see any new questions coming up. I think we're going to keep on going. Okay, in terms of weeds, um, we've helped a lot of you, a lot of you and a lot of people take out lawn and put in alternate lawns. Here's an alternative lawn, and we love them. But you'd really, even this alternative lawn, it's not going to stand up to, to foot traffic, to dogs walking on it. Um, for so many years as, as regular lawns. So we have to have lawns and we have to keep them healthy. And that's what, that's looking straight down. Sharon, if you're listening, I'm sorry, but it's your lawn. Looking straight down. That's what the lawn looks like. Look how thin that is. Aren't, don't you feel sorry for those grass plants trying to grow in there? That chickweed <coughs> has sprouted in every bare spot that it could get and is going to take over the lawn. If you want a healthy lawn right now, weed it which means get rid of the chickweed and stuff that's on the edge that keeps throwing seeds into your lawn. The speed well, the weeds on the edge, get rid of them. Um, weed out the areas where you've got them in the lawn. You can use a herbicide to kill them because it's a really big area, or you can spot weed, which is what we do. But don't just weed, help the lawn. Help it get thicker so it can fill those areas itself. And it's not just fertilizer. It's not fertilizer that necessarily makes the lawn thicker. No. Don't think that that fertilization program that they're selling you to get eight to 12 applications is going to make your lawn thicker and, and might be greener, but no. not necessarily thicker. Um, you want right now is the perfect time to get any of the slow organic fertilizers. Um, kelp green sand, dried blood, fish meal, bone meal, poultry manure. Um, these What's are the one they don't want in group for lawns now, phosphorus? Phosphorus is something that on established lawns, especially if you live on a lake, you don't need phosphorus and, and you shouldn't be putting phosphorus down. Very few of the, of the, the organics are high in phosphorus, but even if they are, what's good about the slow release organics is that they are made from organic matter and like mulch, they have to break down before the plants can use their component parts. They break down by microbes breaking them down and then the microbes excrete stuff. So they're using the fertilizer is the poop of, of microbes. Um, so uh, your organic slow release fertilizers don't end up dissolving into rainwater and washing off into the, the um, storm drains and or the lakes. down in the lakes, yeah. So get some slow release organic fertilizer and remember that it's not just your lawn you're putting it on, it's you're fertilizing that tree back there has roots under that lawn. You might not think so, but the roots go a lot further than the, the leaves go. I have yes. to Okay. <laughs> oh, um, Clearing my throat. This year, <laughs> Vegetables, uh, they're here to star. We, yeah, yeah we were is, talking uh, ourselves about um, uh, finishing the lawn. Oh, sorry. Aerate it. It needs looser soil. If you can aerate, aerate. If you can't aerate, at least top dress with fertilizer. Liquid seaweed on lawn. Liquid seaweed on lawn. Yes. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. And this sorry. is not. I am not sick. Uh, I'm just chronically sinus infected, and then it's draining into my throat. Um, uh, the fertilizers that are liquid are not slow. The plants take them up right away and you can use them now. Some years, no, because the ground is too cold, but the ground is warm enough now, the plants are growing and you can use them. Well, okay. um, I'm going to go get the lab. Steve, you can. Okay. 
just talk about vegetables and our fruit. Yeah, this year we're, we've talked about what are we going to do uh, uh, in our front swale. Uh, last year we had pumpkins and, and watermelon in them and they did quite well. Um, harvested a few watermelon um, and one pumpkin, I think. Uh, this year we're talking about what we're going to put in if we're going to put some vegetables in. I think that might be something a lot of gardeners are going to be talking about due to this uh, situation um, going on with uh, us and this virus. Anyway, um, question, quick question about aerate spring or fall. Either any, uh, I worked on a golf course, they would core aerate whenever. They never had a, a absolute time. Spring and fall are the best. We core aerated last uh, fall. Um, got a core aerator that we shared between five neighbors and that we're able to get five yards done in Corey, and we're thinking about doing it again this spring, but again, we're up in the air about what's gonna happen. Um, <clears throat> uh, back to vegetables, a lot of vegetables will, uh, people are growing for color too, uh, in that, and add them in. Here's a chart on, uh, mm, sorry, I didn't see this part. Uh, it's a chart about, about the vegetables that we could put in and some of their problems and things that that may happen with with them um they are something that take uh quite a bit of care um vegetables yeah i wasn't 100 oh, percent sure about the chart i put it up late last night and you didn't realize i was putting it in here um we've got this chart and it's on our website we'll uh uh, if you go to presentations and things you can download, you'll you'll find it there. I'll I'll highlight that for you as best we can when we get done. But I pulled this up to indicate which ones you can put out by seed now. You should definitely grow some things from seed. You're, it's too early to put out plants that were started in a greenhouse. But this is a chart that we made up with information that we think is important. On the uh, the third column from the left shows when you can start the seed indoors. But look at the fourth column on the uh, from the left. That's when you can set them out outside. And this is for our area. If you're warmer, uh, you're down in Dayton, you're down in Cincinnati, um, you're out in Cape Cod, you can start it a little bit earlier. But look, it's time for peas. You can put peas in the ground the 1st of April. Read down the list and you'll see broccoli and cauliflower the 15th of April. And because it's warm this year, they can go, go ahead and seed them in. Um, radishes, spinach, lettuces, um, other ones that are show later are later because the new plant it needs warmth. And it needs or it, it will just stunt and get root rot more likely if you put it in too soon. Yeah, root rot and stem stem infections. Um, but I had my friend Jim. I wish Jim was listening with us right now. Always planted his peas on St. Patty's Day. St. Patty's Day, I plant the peas. peas. <laughs> and he also put uh, old tomatoes out then too. They didn't germinate right away. But you've got the room, so put this stuff out now, and you can you can get things started earlier. Radishes, um, and uh, things like lettuce and and broccoli. Go ahead and seed them out. I think this is going to be the year that people are going to to say, "Wow, it's nice that they're growing vegetables." And guess what? All those kids are walking by each other's house, people's houses. Put some vegetables out front. Let the kids know where food comes from. Um, yeah. Let's get them engaged in the garden. Yes. We may have quite a, a revolution going on here this year. Yeah. Our, our grandkids know about service berries from our tree that none of the other neighborhood kids even realize service berry and mulberry can be, can be eaten. eaten. Boy, so. didn't those of us who grew up with them nearby know that. Um, on this chart, if you want to download it later, we've got plants. Uh, they're grouped by families. So spinach is in white there. It's the only goosefoot family plant in the group. But then the, the next bunch, squash, cuke, pumpkin, watermelon, are all in the same family. And so we've worked this chart to also help you know that you can't keep growing squash in the same place every year because the, the diseases it gets over toward the right, you'll see the words flea beetle, cabbage maggot. Um, the things that get into a plant's family are going to infect others in that same family. So last year, we grew pumpkin and watermelon out in our front yard in the swale. And people loved it. Yep. They said, wow, is that Green pumpkin? We even is that watermelon? Uh, yeah. Some watermelon. Uh, I think we're going to see more of that this year. 
So, uh, and there are, of course, perennials you can, you can put out like asparagus. Yeah. Okay, now he's got to go. The labs are, the black labs are, are yelling at us and we don't so know much. why. Um, also, things like fruit trees. If you've got room in your front yard, why not a fruit tree? It is not hard to espalier to keep small. You can keep them flat or you can keep them small doing this every year. Um, just like we pruned the uh, panicle, the uh, blue and pink hydrangeas or the oak leaf hydrangea, you can keep this apple small by every year cutting old wood out, leaving some wood to bloom, and then after it grows and blooms, then you clip it short, and you can keep it looking just like you just saw it there. I mean, why not? Let's put some more stuff in front yards. And maybe if this year we put up pretty things, like this is an old, um, one of the old uh, uh, laundry hanging uh, or pieces of hardware used to hold up peas and peas, put them in the ground, put something pretty for them to climb on and put them for the neighbors to see. Maybe by the end of summer, people will get so used to seeing vegetables that they'll let you put out things like the old um, backstop for your, your pitcher used as something for your cucumbers to climb on. Um, and seed is best, don't put plants out. Uh, it might be that seed is not yet in at the garden centers and they do get new seed every year. Uh, bottom of the picture, you might be able to read that it says sell by 1219. That's some seed packets that I have from last year. Um, companies that sell seed must observe that date. And the reason is that the seed inside is guaranteed to be usually about 80 to 90 percent germination rate. So of every 10 seeds I plant, eight or nine of them are guaranteed to, to sprout. By the time they've sat for a year, that germination rate might fall to 70%, to 60%, to 50%, but the seed is still good. So if you've got old seed like we have, go ahead and use it. Go ahead and, and put it out there. And there's always so many seed. If we grew every seed and In that harvest, package, oh man. It, it, you <clears throat> couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Okay, um, we're just, we're on, a, when, we're on the last thing we prepared for you to talk about, and, uh, and we'll come up with something more later. Oh dear, I misspelled a lot, and showing you the slides this You way, misspelled a word. I just Oof. wanna make an, a plea right now while people are out. Space is so important in design. Space. For people, all gardeners tend to think is, how can I get another plant in there? What can I plant in that space? We've all walked around holding a plant in our hand where can or i put two, this or two mm. uh, you're looking at the front of leo's house here and there's sedum autumn joy and the grass called uh, morning light and behind it some yews you're looking from the the sidewalk in and this is that same place could you even tell that sidewalk was there Look, you can move your plantings out, away from the house. Get is them away from the house. <laughs> from the street, which is what most of us are designing for, there's room to move out. So move out. Give yourself some room. Give some people room to walk. Give some room to wash windows. At Sue's house, um, one of the many Sue's that we work, work with, um, we've just planted all new stuff here. And this is all new and change the front walkway to put this little sitting area. And that's what it looks like between our plantings and the house. And it's wonderful. You can walk, even when those, those, those are snowball hydrangeas, the old fashioned snowball hydrangeas and witch hazel beyond them. There's room to wash the windows and to deal with maintenance stuff. It used to look like this. I mean, it's just ridiculous. You can't wash the windows if you had to take down the, work on the brick or anything. You need to leave yourself room yeah. for maintenance. Some people say that I want, pri I want privacy, um, no, I want security. I don't want people to sneak around and look in my windows. Well, you know what? Um, if you put bushes out there that they have to walk through first to get there and they're prickly bushes, it works the same as their prickly bushes like holly oh, under the window. Yeah. So leave room, leave room for people. We've got all of this lawn in the United States. I don't think we've got any of our international um, overseas listeners, list, uh, subscribers listening, but we do have people in Hawaii. We have a couple in Thailand. We have somebody in Australia who subscribed to our newsletter. And, and in those other places, they don't have huge lawns like we have, but look at this. We're looking from Sue's front yard out on the top left. And there's all that space. 
Why put it up against the house? There on the bottom right is what we did with it. Why not make a big space and give those spruces their own place to grow without lawn nibbling away at all their water and nutrients? This is our new house. Those of you who are listening who are in the neighborhood who joined us because of the Facebook um, page, we're the, the by level with the who would ever think to put a white door on that house. This yeah. is when we moved in. This was about 15 minutes later because the very first thing I did was get the heck rid of those burning bushes and a dwarf spruce growing underneath the crab apple in the front. Get them out of there for crying out loud. What, is, what are well, we thinking? Correction, the first thing we did was decided paths. Oh yeah, we started mowing those paths. We'll get to those later. For Don't you. worry. Um, coming into our house from the driveway was, look at this, this is gardeners who do this, this little bitty two foot walkway and we're planting plants that lap over the walkway, uh, Lily of the Valley of all things, and putting arborvitaes right next to the building where we really don't need them. We took that out, it's gone. We took the arborvitaes out, um, and at the end of the walkway, where you can't even tell that it goes to our door, you see bushes down there, they're gone. We got a walkway, we got a, a sitting area down there and a walkway out onto the lawn it used to look like this. And maybe more importantly for me, from the inside of the house, hey, Julie, do you recognize that cat seat? Um, that's what it looked like. We were looking out the windows at the bottoms of bushes. It's, Who wants to look at that? Why? Who, why? Oh, <laughs> there were people not yeah. thinking, not thinking. You um, want to look out. And underneath overhangs is not a good place to plant anyway. They had plants in here and the soil was way high up above the windowsill. I've lowered it and I'm not gonna to try to plant plants. And, in and, the roof, and the roof line actually comes out halfway onto the sidewalk. Yeah, yeah. I mean. It, it, so we asked friends, I, we put concrete mix, uh, cement and concrete mix together, like ready mix into squares. And we asked friends to press stones into it for us. So a bunch of friends made us designs and we're, we're filling that area with designs that friends made. I mean, if it's not good for plants, don't ask plants to grow there. And if people should walk there, let people walk there. For sure. For sure. For sure. For sure. For sure, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, in Canada, her daffs are ending up yellow. I well, there was think people are seeing Deb that. asked a question before oh. about drip the temperatures going below freezing. Do we need to cover the bulb growth? We do not need to cover bulb growth. Temperatures are going to go below freezing. Um, for the most part, they're going to drop down into the 20s now in our area. We might get a few teens at night still, but mostly they're going to be in the 20s. And that amount of cold can't counteract the amount of warmth oozing out of the soil and coming up. It's keeping your bulb foliage warm. It's just fine. You might look out in the morning and see that the bulb foliage has splayed out on the ground because it got cold but it's kept itself warm on the ground, it's gonna come right back up again. So don't cover the bulbs, don't need to do that. No. Um, a wine rack, someone, I, I hope everybody is seeing these chats that are coming up, a wine rack for, for squashes, that's cool. And there are a lot of those things available at flea markets. Yeah, starting seeds, great activity for kids, yes. Yeah, oh, that's oh, that's yeah. another issue that we're gonna be Yep. have to discuss is what to do with these kids now yeah my problem um, with kids is not is i always want to be close to them while i'm doing yes. stuff with them and the neighbor kids are out and i want them to help me plant seeds but i'm gonna to have to show them how and say here you do it now and yep. we'll have to stay away from each other we can't for a bit i, I at I, least us I, us I'm, too we're yeah well i guess i'm in the older group now too but steve's got some underlying health issues Okay. Um, but I feel great. Yeah. There's oh, okay. nothing wrong now. I think. All right. So, all are there other questions? Yeah. Anything you want to ask, you can ask in the chat. Um, do we want to turn? Do we want to turn? turn no, no. Um, no. So, too confusing Stephen's with asking all the microphones. We, right. If we turned on everything, there are a hundred of us here. If I turned on the microphones, we would we would probably all die. Um, so we we don't want to have that happen. So if you don't wanna stay and chat with us, because we're gonna stay here, we can keep this meeting open. Um, and if you wanna stay and type in your questions, you can do that and we'll type them back. Or you can type in your question and, and uh, 
um, go away, we can email you an answer. Or you can go to the forum. We'll put answers into the newsletters that are coming up. We'll post them on the forum. And we, we intend to keep on doing these weekend walkabouts as long as we need to do them or you tell us that we need to do it. And let us know how we did. Yeah, um, um, those, some people have left already, so I should have said this earlier. You will get a feedback form from the company that operates the software we're using. I don't care if you fill that out, frankly. We will send you a feedback form. We just haven't got it put together yet. We'd love to hear from you on that, what topics you want to hear, how we did, how your end looked to you. But we'll put that in a form and send that to you a little bit later. Should we cut old leaves from the hellebores? Yes. Definitely cut old leaves off the hellebores. Definitely. One of our videos uh, this shows week. Uh, on Facebook. Uh, one of the links on our. Uh, on our newsletter. In our newsletter takes you to a Facebook video about <clears throat> cutting the hellebore leaf. Yeah, grooming the hellebores. They really do look great. Thank you, everybody, for being That's here. Awesome. It was so yeah. wonderful to read the names of the that are on the list and to say I know all these people from so many years back. Thank you. So if you're leaving now, we'll see you next time. Uh, we'll certainly stay in touch with the newsletter. You can email us anytime. You can put stuff on the forum anytime. We get to them all. Sometimes it takes us a while, but we get to them all. What shrubs can you put under a window near an air conditioning unit? Um, to the point of space, give the air conditioner space. Look at what you, where you really see it from and ask yourself, can I move that and plant something that's four feet out from it and not right next to it? Because almost nothing grows right next to an air conditioning unit. Almost nothing will put up with that. Um, but if you're in kind of a partly shaded area like that because you're on the north side of a house and you want something to cover a, a, um, an air conditioning unit, I would definitely consider Japanese holly. Um, Golden Victory Privet, if the wind, the summertime is the only need, time you need to cover it. Um, the spireas do very well in the part shade, especially the big spireas that grow fast, like the old uh, dwarf, the old uh, Van Hoot spireas and Snow Mound spireas. Um, the fine dark mulch that we showed, we buy it called Woody Fines, F-I-N-E-S, or we, fi we find it called processed bark or triple shredded. Um, but even when we hear the names, we go see it before we buy it because there's no uniform standard for what you call these things. Um, so it's, it's a very finely ground mar uh, mulch that's made mostly of bark. Down south, they can't believe how lucky we are to get it. Pine straw works really well too. It just, it looks, it looks different, it's lighter. It takes longer to break down. Mm -hmm. And it's a little slippery to walk on. Um. Let's see. Oh, Patty, it's so good to have have had you here. Let's see, I don't see any more questions coming right now. And we are just about out of time. Um, we might need to cut forsythias to the ground once a year. If you're forsythias, um, you, uh, normally if I'm keeping a forsythia small, I cut it twice a year. This time of year, I take whole canes out at the ground and just get them out of there. And then after it blooms, I shorten the other canes. If I'm trying to keep it very small, I cut it once a year all the way to the ground right after it blooms. Pine straw instead of wood mulch. Um, yes, um, you can buy pine straw by bales and then we can keep them stacked up someplace and, and it, it does work. I, yes, switch to pine straw, Julie, that works. Um, will you publish your answers to our questions? We'll put them on the forum as we can get them up there. We've got a bunch stacked up right now, but what we do is we, we have a, an alias called Your Letters and we post your letters on the forum, and then we answer them. So um, yeah, we're not going to publish this chat per se. Well, uh, we'll have to take a look at it. I haven't been watching it all as it went by, but um, it, it wasn't too many questions, so no. it'll probably be up there. Okay. Well, um, yeah. So you may want to copy your your chat to remember the question, and then you can post the question to us, and we'll get it back to you in email or a forum if we didn't get to it today. Completely covered. Heck yeah, completely covered with Creeping Charlie. If, if I've got huge areas covered with Creeping Charlie, we smother the whole area. We put um, newspaper and mulch on top of it. There'll be something about that next week in our newsletter um, to, to kill it off. And we try to find out where else the infestation lies. So if it's in the neighbor's yards too, then we have to work with the neighbors to try to keep it out or establish a, a barrier zone 
where nothing is growing, uh, where we can keep it from creeping back in. Where to find the seed starting chart on the website? Download the whole chat to see what people were saying. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Doc. If you click the three dots in your chat window, uh, the bubble on the right, you can download the whole chat to see what people are saying. Lesser celandine, yes, it's a good time because lesser celandine is like the bulb weeds. The bulb weeds are awful. They, um, they're they getting their energy real early. So right now is the time to get them. If we weed them out later, they've already got a whole month's worth of growth and, and a lot of energy in their roots. Find your seed starting on the website. I can't remember what um, it's if, if you go to, um, well, let's see if I can do that right now. We'll take this out of the way. Here's where my shaky hand throws me off and we'll go on to the internet. Um, in uh, About Us, where we're appearing, um, yes, I know it's not for crying out loud. So we'll go to uh, Garden A to Z. I'll go to .com because A to Z.org is just migrating, just today it's migrating. If I go to About Us and where we're appearing, let's see. I'll just use it over here, where we're appearing. Um, someplace, there it is, presentations to download underneath where we're appearing. And if you read down the list there, there are all kinds of presentations. They come down to you as a PDF. And I think that one is called Edible Gardening. Edible Landscapes. Edible Landscapes. So if you see Edible Landscapes under where we're appearing, presentations to download, you can download it. And you'll need to go to .com because they're all sitting on .com right now. .org is the one that we've been bringing up to speed and is just migrating. It'll be a while before they're all at .org. But there you go. Um, Julie. Smother dig poison for the lesser celandine. Absolutely. Any any um uh tactic for weeds this time of year. Um you can use a if they are up and growing like celandine is. So you can use the poisons on them, you can dig them out, or you can smother them. But whatever you do needs to be done now because now is their active growing time. If we wait until later, they've already stored all the energy and are done. Yeah, deer. Deer are the bane of a lot of people right now. Yeah. A lot of deer population out there. And and, and that includes gardeners at horticultural uh, <clears throat> uh, public gardens, like arboretums and botanical gardens. And what they do is fence them out. Fence. Um, that's the only thing that actually works. So fence a part of your yard, put deer fence up. If you're in you're in our situation we cannot put fences up it's just not allowed in the neighborhood then we have to to protect individual plants that too will be next week on the um on the website we've got an article about that because we protect plants that they are most likely to to harm young plants plants they like to rub against plants they like to eat and we just try to make it as pretty as possible the buck rubs are in my uh, the Audrey, eating I could handle, but the buck rub. So good to see your name when I looked at the list. Oh, Thank Audrey. you, Audrey. Talk to you later. Can you yes, you can prune it? Japanese maples now, Luann. They will probably weep, which means that sap will flow from where you cut them. It doesn't hurt the tree. It bothers us to see it doing it. You think it's dying? Yeah, the tree's not losing anything, and it's not wasting. Um, wasting resources in that sap. That sap was only going to that branch that you cut out. So the only thing that's happening is it's losing that sap. So it'll probably weep, but you can definitely prune them now. I have two left to do on my list from winter and I'm gonna prune them now. Okay, I'm not sure if we missed anything. I'm gonna sit here and look through my chat. I think I'm probably gonna turn off the camera so I don't have to worry about whether I'm biting my tongue or, or drooling. Deb Hall is going to buy yeah. us seed cushions. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're, 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 we were sitting here trying to decide, where, where are we going to do where this? Where are we going to sit? Know, where are we going to sit? And while well, these seem very logical, except for on the butt. Yeah. Well, let's see who's left. I'm going to do There's this. 43, it says right here. Yeah, I'm going to go. Okay. I'm going to do this. Just because we're here for a minute and we can try this. I'm going to unmute everybody. 
I download now. Now everybody's oh, unmuted. If you've got a loud okay. person sitting next to you, you might want to tell them. Okay. Quiet, it. guys. Quiet. So, if you want to talk, do this. Type a message and say, "Want to talk?" Quiet. And I'll call Stop. on you. Ah. Hello, Janet. That sounds like Stop. Cindy. I didn't see you say I want to talk, so Thank I can't you say it's so your much. turn. Yeah. <laughs> you have good oh. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if you if anyone is listening who wants to turn their mic off, you have a mute button. Um, the duck has found it there and says at the bottom left of her screen. So if you want to turn off your mic, you can do that. Uh, Nobody wow. wants to talk. Hey Julie, what do you want to say? Okay, so I got big dead spots in my creeping box and that stuff that we put in that looks sort of like box. Should I cut out everything that looks dead? Pass. Yes. Julie's got a situation where she's got creeping flocks and she's got weeds that are, well, undesirable plants, perennials that shouldn't have put themselves there, coming up in there. And yes, now is the time to, to loosen and, and drag all those things out of there, cut them out of there, or it wouldn't hurt the flocks at all. You could just cut the flocks into squares and lift the whole thing. If you flip flocks or myrtle or other ground covers like that upside down, you'll be able to see the difference between their roots and the roots of what you don't want. And you can pull them from the bottom side back through. And it's amazing how the plants don't have any resistance then. It's a lot easier to pull weeds opposite, pull them from their roots and out. But yeah, now's the time. Anyone else want to talk? Oh, uh, MKA? Yeah, hi, Janet and Stephen. This is Marilyn Olympic. Hello, Marilyn. Uh, I, this was really great because I would normally be at Tollgate right now. Ah, so right. I'm saving that for the week when the weather's a little nicer. Um, I'm nice glad that you're not showing photos, our pictures. I thank you for that. Oh, oh, the that's your choice. You're welcome. I don't you're welcome. want anybody to see me while I'm having breakfast this morning. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you. This is cool. This is wonderful. Well, thank you very well, thank much you. for saying so, Marilyn. Anyone else want to talk? Jared. Just... Jared. Jared, go. Thank you so much for doing this. It totally changed my paradigm from Fox News, where I've been scared, to, oh my gosh, there is new life in the garden. Thank you and Steve so much without my heart for doing this this morning. God bless you both. Oh, Sharon, well, thank, thank you, thank you so for saying much. that. And yes, there is so much we can do. It really might be the very best year in our lives for our gardens because- Amen, <laughs> girl. Amen, amen. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sharon. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Okay, we're going to, we're going to take off now uh, and figure out what just happened. We'll, uh, we'll let you know in our newsletter what we, what we made of this and then what kind of schedule we what come we up with. Learned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to Enjoy press the button to end the meeting here if I can find that button.